Good evening. Thank you for those who have joined us tonight for our COVID vaccine panel. Uh, we want to give a special uh, shout out and, and appreciation to the Bristol Hospital Diversity Committee and the local Bristol chapter of the NAACP for joining us. We're also happy to have some board members, employees, and medical staff from Bristol Health joining this evening. Um, a huge, huge thank you to uh, Lexi Magnum uh, for his help with the, uh, setting up this meeting. Um, Lexi was also one of our first recipients to receive the COVID vaccine here at Bristol Health. So Lexi is the president of the Bristol NAACP and a member of the Bristol Health Board of Directors. So uh, much appreciation, Lexi. Thank you for setting this up. We, uh, we here at Bristol Hospital are excited to be on this national effort to get the vaccine available for the population in accordance with the uh, state guidelines. So um, thank you very much. With us tonight, we have Dr. Andrew Lim, Bristol Health Medical Director of Emergency Medicine, Dr. Richard Zweig, Bristol Health Medical Director of Infectious Disease, Dr. Charles Ekenem, Bristol Health Division of Hospitalist Medicine, and myself, uh, Albert Peguero, our Manager of Emergency Preparedness. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, this evening's uh, panel is gonna be held virtually. It is being recorded and will be made available afterwards. I ask that you keep yourself on mute um, so that our panelists can answer questions as they come in and be able to provide accurate and uh, full information and allow our guests and attendees to listen in. If you do have questions, you can type them into the chat box and we will try to get to them at the end of our panel. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Andrew Lin for a couple words. All right, th uh, thanks, Albert, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, as many of you, I, I think I know many of you on this call, but my background is emergency medicine. Um, and, you know, frankly, you know, the, the point of tonight was to have um, pretty much an open Q&A for, for any and all of you to ask any questions whatsoever about the vaccine. Um, I'm a big proponent of the vaccine. I think this is absolutely one of the, this is clearly one of the best and biggest um, advances that we've had in terms of medicines against COVID-19. Um, but I understand that getting the vaccine is, is totally a personal decision um, that, that we all need to make on our own and we need to be comfortable with that decision. It's not something that you know, any of us should be pressured into taking or, or coerced into taking. Um, but I think you need, we all need to have the facts um, about it to make an educated decision. Um, I did receive the vaccine um, a week and a half ago and I'm doing well. Um, so, and I look forward to receiving my second dose as well too. Um, personally, you know, when the news of the vaccine came out, um, I, I was overjoyed. Um, as many of you know, especially in the ED and being on the front lines, um, this disease has just wreaked havoc, havoc in our professional lives uh, and our personal lives. And it is really one of the biggest um, uh, challenges for, for all of us uh, or most of us, uh, you know, uh, in many aspects of our lives. Um, a few months ago, we actually didn't even know if a vaccine would be available um, or whether a vaccine would even work. So the, the data so far that, you know, um, to have two vaccines that have 95% effectiveness is truly miraculous. Um, typically, most viral vaccines, like the flu vaccine, um, can have an effectiveness of somewhere on the range of 50 to 60%. So to have something that's um, shown this much promise is, is truly amazing. So one of the concerns is that um, you know, it was brought to market quickly. Um, and then know the, the long-term effects. Um, and I acknowledge that there's no long-term data just because of the, the nature of this disease that it's so new. I approach this as I approach any patient sitting in front of me in the ED, um, in the ER. A lot of times in the ER, we have, um, we have to make a risk benefit analysis, right? We have to look at, you know, what is the risk of taking this medication? What is the risk of not taking this medication? What are the benefits? Um, and I think in this situation, given what we know about the risk of COVID, the risk of spreading it to others, um, you know, I think the benefit greatly outweighs the risk of, of taking the vaccine. I think this is how, um, if Dr. we can Dr. Reach, Lim, I, yep. I, I think that's a great, great uh, point. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to ask Dr. Ekenem, who has uh, worked in the hospital, in the hospital's medicine, about yeah. some of the, those consequences of COVID that you have seen. 
and then we'll come back to you, Dr. Lim. Yeah, thanks, Albert. Sure. My name is uh, Charles Ekanem, and uh, I work alongside Dr. Uh, with Dr. Lim and uh, Dr. Zweig. Um, I work mainly on the medical floor and ICU, and my impression with COVID-19 infection has been that of a very devastating infection that has left uh, many people grieved. And, uh, you know, this has also been associated with immense uh, mobility and mortality. Um, you know, patients uh, with a um, comorbid medical condition seems to be the uh, very ill ones and also patients that have been uh, ventilated here. Uh, recovery seems to be quite prolonged in those kind of patients. And uh, honestly, I think I have uh, written more death certificates uh, during this entire uh, period uh, compared to uh, several years that I've practiced medicine. Um, I would also say that those that have uh, recovered from uh, COVID-19 infection uh, tends to have, uh, you know, long-term problems with um, uh, memory. Some patients are, you know, left with tracheostomy and uh, feeding tube. You know, no one actually knows uh, the long-term sequelae of the pulmonary illness associated with COVID infection. And it's quite possible that most patients will end up having chronic lung disease. Uh, the uh, psychological trauma has been very profound. In some cases, you know, family members are asked to make decisions uh, regarding end of life, especially in patients with very poor prognosis. You know, this tends to be, you know, kind of very overwhelming to family members. I understand that uh, nearly 40% of re reported cases of COVID have been linked to, you know, Black and uh, Latino people. Uh, according to CDC. So this brings us to the question of what has to be done to curtail the pandemic. <clears throat> In my humble opinion, I believe that uh, the most assuring means is vaccination. Uh, there has been debates and uh, concerns uh, regarding the safety of this vaccine, especially in African-American communities. I have taken the vaccine myself and uh, the, you know, the only slight side effect that I had was uh, pain at the injection site and it lasted less than 24 hours. The uh, misconception that the vaccine will turn you know, people into zombies, aliens, or alter someone's DNA is uh, not true. Um, thank, thank you, Dr. Akinem. It it's, uh, sounds like there's, there's very drastic uh, consequences of, of catching this disease and, and being infected with it. So, doc, Dr. Lim, I, I'd like to go back to you. It sounds like you were going to go into some of the safety uh, trials that were done. So hearing those those uh, kind of consequences, do you want to speak a little bit about those benefits of, of getting the vaccine? Yeah, of course. And, you know, you know, with the, the vaccine was, uh, you know, although it was, um, it, it came to market in record time, um, you know, what I, what I keep telling people is that, you know, it was brought to market in record time for good reason, because we had all of the world's best scientists, all the world's resources dedicated towards getting this vaccine to market. Um, you know, and a lot of us, and, and no one wants to be a guinea pig, right? No one wants to be the first person to try this, uh, to make sure it's safe. Thankfully, you know, through phase three clinical trials, there were, you know, about 40, there were 40,000 brave volunteers just in the Pfizer study um, and tens of thousands more volunteers in the Moderna study. So 20,000 people of various backgrounds of, of ethnicity and living in various countries um, were given the vaccine to make sure that it was safe. Um, and there was not one single serious safety concern uh, with administering the vaccine in 20,000 people. And they found that even after um, seven days um, of the first dose, um, there was immunity. You, you actually had a 50% chance, um, uh, less chance of getting COVID. And at one week after the second dose or about four weeks after your first dose, um, you had a 97 or 95% chance 
of less like you're 95 percent less likely to get covid so the benefits the benefits were were huge um and as i said you know in the news there are going to be reports of of um allergic reactions you know when you give a vaccine to you know millions of people throughout the world um, there will be people who have allergic reactions <clears throat> but I, I i think this is analogous to almost any medication a medication such as tylenol or motrin which is over the counter and generally accepted as, as safe um, we take care of patients in the ed who have uh, anaphylaxis to these um, seemingly safe over-the-counter medications so it's something that you know it's it's something that you need to keep an eye on um, it's something that we talk with our patients about um but as i said you know in, in my book this is how this is how we can end the pan pandemic and return to normal um you know i think we all agree that you know this is this is the goal that we're looking for i've, I've heard i've read estimates that you know we can achieve 70 percent of the population being vaccinated or having immunity to covid through getting the infection we can achieve this kind of golden herd immunity um, and i think it's that point where we'll start to see infection rates drop Mm -hmm. We can start to see public health um, recommendations mm -hmm. change where we don't need to wear a mask, where we can eat inside, where we can have mass gatherings and parties and, and go about our lives much how uh, they were about a year ago. Thank you, Dr. Lemon. And I'd also like to point out that Bristol Hospital has been fortunate to uh, mm -hmm. administer about close to, to 1,300 vaccines since we've started our clinic. And uh, I hope I'm not jinxing myself, but we haven't seen zero adverse reactions um, to date. Um, but I, I'd like to ask, uh, introduce Dr. Zweig. Dr. Zweig, Dr. Lim spoke a, a, a bit about herd immunity and the uh, kind of protection that you get or, or that's expected after you receive both doses of this vaccine. Can you speak about the importance of following social distancing and face mask um, even after the vaccine is, is, is received? Do we need to continue to follow those? Yeah, sure, Albert, thanks. Uh, yes, even though you get the vaccine, you still need to practice proper precautions. And the reason is that uh, we don't know yet whether or not once you receive the vaccine, whether you can still be a carrier or acquire the virus and, ba and basically be colonized with it. So for that reason, you need to uh, practice hygiene and wear a face mask. The trials were done in both Pfizer and Moderna to see whether or not the vaccine was effective to prevent severe clinical COVID illness. And it was, as Andrew said, 94, 95%. But the trials did not look at to see whether or not patients who received the vaccine were actually infected with the virus during the course uh, of the uh, vaccination period. Those studies are ongoing. So we don't know whether or not patients acquire the COVID virus, which in this case would be infection without disease, and whether or not patients who have the vaccine, if they do acquire the infection, can they pass it on to other people? We don't know that yet. The studies are being done. So for that reason, until we know more, you got to practice social distancing, you got to wear a mask, you got to practice hygiene, because while you're developing immunity, there is a chance that you could transmit the virus to someone else. We just don't know the answer to that yet. Thank you, Dr. Zweig. And Dr. Zweig, I, we had a question submitted uh, beforehand, um, and it's really in, in line with this. So once I'm vaccinated, do I, should I be tested if I feel I've been exposed or if I'm experiencing symptoms? Well, uh, <clears throat> given the fact that the vaccine is 95% effective when measured with say Pfizer, which is one week after the second dose, and with Moderna, two weeks after the second dose, it's very unlikely that you are going to develop uh, infection. However, you could develop the COVID disease in the very early period before you develop any immunity. And we've seen that actually. So that if you got the vaccine, the first vaccine on a Monday, and you started getting ill on Wednesday, with typical COVID symptoms, which would be fever, cough, et cetera, you should get tested because it's possible you don't have immunity yet and you picked up the virus along the way through a social contact or something in that line. But once you've had the two vaccines and you're feeling fine, it's unlikely you're going to develop COVID uh, after the second dose. 
Albert, Thank I just you, want, Dr. Zoy. Yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in. You know, one one interesting question that I've been asked before is whether um, you can become contagious after getting the vaccine. You know, I think there's a little bit of confusion of, about whether this vaccine is a live virus. And, you know, because we know that one of the um, one of the side effects is that a percentage of patients, because they're developing immunity, do spike a fever in the 24 to 48 hours after getting the vaccine. And the question was asked, you know, in that time when you have a fever, can you give COVID to someone else? And the short answer is no. Um, developing a fever um, in that time period, 99% of the time, when it's if it's from the vaccine, you you will not, you're not infectious, you cannot give COVID. But to Dr. Zweig's point, you know, we expect that, you know, in the first 24 to 48 hours, if you have, you can have muscle aches, um, your arm can hurt, um, as mine did, I did have some um, localized soreness, but some people also do have uh, a low-grade fever for 24 to 48 hours. So what I would recommend for anyone who does receive the vaccine and does develop some sort of symptoms, um, you know, you can, you should reach out to your primary care doctor for further um, assistance because in some cases um, you can, you, you know, you can still get the infection when you're in between the first and second shot. And 95% is not 100%. You know, as we're saying, you're much more likely, you're much less likely to get COVID, but it's not impossible. So um, you still need to get tested. Um, it's not 100% effective, although it's very helpful. Right. Uh, Albert, I also wanted to talk about, uh, you know, different types of immunity. We talk about immunity from the vaccine, okay? Uh, but we also talk about immunity from natural infection. So I want to assure patients that if you've had COVID before, it's a good chance that you have some degree of immunity. We don't exactly know how long it'll last, but we know a little bit more than we knew in the spring. Matter of fact, a recent article just came out that said that it's probably over six months immunity. If you've had COVID, you're protected for a six month period of time because you develop antibodies as well as active T cells and B cells. So that's good to know, but we don't know how long it's gonna last. And when you get the vaccine on top of that, you get what we call a boosted immune response. And that's important. So your immunity should be long lasting after that. Thank, thank you, doctors. And it sounds from uh, from your responses that we got that uh, it it creates a better understanding of why the state continues with their uh, their travel restrictions and why many organizations, including Bristol Hospital, are continuing with the travel restriction policy that is in place. Uh, Dr. Zweig, I, I, I think uh, the end of your comment veered right into uh, my next question is, if I have recently had COVID, is it okay to defer the vaccine um, and for how long? Yes, uh, that question comes up a lot, Albert. Uh, <clears throat> actually, we recommend if you recently have COVID within the last, say, 90 days, or if you've received the monoclonal <laughs> antibody in the emergency room or another clinic because you've had COVID with mild disease, it's recommended you wait 90 days before you get the vaccine. Now, why is this? Well, first of all, the initial thought was that um, there might be a shortage of the vaccine. And since, as I just mentioned, you are immune for several months, let other people get the <clears throat> vaccine first, who may be exposed, who may be on the front lines and may not be immune. So that's one reason. The other reason is if you get the vaccine too soon, you're liable to get a real hyperimmune response uh, in terms of side effects. So it's best to wait 90 days to get the vaccine, whether you've received monoclonal antibody or you've had a recent episode of COVID within the last 90 days. Thank you. Um, and and I, I'll open up this next question to uh, either, either Dr. Akinem, Dr. Lim, or Dr. Zweig. Um, what if we, we spoke briefly about side effects and, and things of that nature, um, what side effects would, do, would you consider to be, uh, normal? So for example, uh, Dr. Lim, you mentioned fever for a little bit after receiving the vaccine. Uh, but we know of some symptoms that are very related to COVID itself. So if I receive the vaccine and the next day I lose my sense of taste or smell, how concerning is that? And what should be my course of action? 
Yeah, that's that's a good point that, you know, some some symptoms are definitely only attributable to the infection itself, um, like loss of taste or smell. Um, and some some symptoms like fever uh, can actually be in both. We know um, from the clinical trials that um, a percent, I think it was about 30 to 40 percent of people um, can develop a, what we call constitutional symptoms or the muscle aches or fever. Um, and that that number goes up a little bit after the second injection. Um, but we know that the, the, we know that the um, injection or the vaccine should not cause um, cough, should not cause nasal congestion, shouldn't, should not cause anything with uh, your taste or smell, um, really should not cause any nausea or vomiting. So there are some symptoms that are specific to the infection um, itself, which are helpful. Fever is, fever is not. Fever you can have in both. Um, so if there's any questions, you know, what we've instructed our staff is, um, you know, re you, you can reach out, reach out to your primary care doctor um, or, or another medical professional. Um, but if it's, if it's just a, a fever that goes away after 24 hours of the vaccine, it's, it's okay to not, not get tested as long as you're doing fine otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Lim. And uh, for everyone on the call, I just put into the uh, chat box the website for the Food and Drug Administration um, for the two vaccines that are currently authorized for emergency use in the United States with much more information about side effects and what to expect with these vaccines. Um, next, I'll, I'll, I'll open, again, I'll open up this question to which uh, whoever on the panel would like to take it. But um, the question is really about doses. How many doses are required? Um, what's the time frame between the doses? And what happens if I'm feeling ill when it's time to receive the second dose? Yes, Albert. <clears throat> so the, both trials for Pfizer and Moderna were done with two doses. Now, there's been some uh, chatter in the literature about maybe you only need one dose, and that would enable us to actually vaccinate double the population. But those studies were not done. So we really can't say to get one dose. You need to get two doses. Pfizer is separated by 21 days and the Moderna vaccine by 28 days. The uh, Pfizer vaccine is given at a dose of uh, 0.3, whereas the uh, Moderna is actually more than three times the dose with the same efficacy. Now, if you've had the first dose and it's up to, let's say, it's almost 21 days and you're, and you're up to the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, you know, if you have illness with fever, cough, you need to get tested and you need to hold off on the vaccine until you rule out COVID. Certainly, you can have another infection, but uh, I would not get the vaccine while you're ill because within three weeks or four weeks, you really shouldn't have any symptoms related to the vaccine, but you can have another infection. So it's good to get that checked out just before you get the vaccine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lim, do you want to uh, speak about the importance of staying with the course of uh, whichever drug that you, you get for your first one? So, uh, for example, if I get the Pfizer, is it okay for me to get the Moderna for my second dose? Yeah, so I, I would not recommend that. Um, that's a, it's a question that I've uh, seen before. You know, if I get the Pfizer the first time, can I get... Moderna the next time, you know, if there's a shortage or if that's what I can find available, definitely um, it's not recommended. Um, you know, they, they are, although they, the two vaccines do have a similar mechanism, um, they're not of identical makeup. So it's not simply like taking Tylenol and then a generic Tylenol afterwards. Um, they are different. Um, and it is, uh, you know, that's a, um, no one that is not, um, that's never been tested before. So if you get Moderna the first time, uh, make sure that you get Moderna the second time and vice versa uh, with the Pfizer and make sure you adhere to the, uh, the recommended um, timing between the doses. Yeah, uh, Albert also wanna point out that uh, there is a vaccine trial that should be ending by the end of January with Johnson & Johnson and their vaccine is one dose. So I'd be very curious to see what their results are after the one dose because here we're talking about, do you need one dose? Do you need two doses? So clearly with what we have now, you need two doses. But we may find out in a few months with the J&J &J vaccine, maybe you only need one dose. Everything uh, currently is in limbo. We'll wait and see. 
Thank you. And I'll come back to that. I just want to address one of the questions that came up in the chat box and has definitely been brought up to, uh, through our vaccine clinic and uh, to the command center. Um, to the best of your knowledge, uh, can you explain the differences between the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine? Um, is one safer over the other? Um, is there any difference whether a person based on age or chronic disease should get either the Pfizer or the Moderna? Right. Uh, that's a very good question, Albert. Uh, they're both mRNA viruses. Uh, they both work the same, but they have different nuances. One needs ultra, an ultra freezer. One just needs a regular freezer, et cetera. One is three times the dose of the other one. They're both 94, 95% effective. The Pfizer vaccine, however, has been shown to be as effective across all ages and ethnic groups. There was one difference in the Moderna vaccine. It was shown to be just slightly less effective in patients over the age of 65. And the company felt that might be due to the fact that there were a few cases of COVID in that age group. I think it came out to 86% effective over the age of 65. That was the only difference. But in terms of race, race and ethnic, they were the same. But by and large, I would say that the vaccines are comparable, they're equivalent, and you can get either one, depends on what's available. Thank you. Um, I, I just like to remind everyone, if you do have questions, you can enter them into the chat box. Um, but at, at this time, um, I just want to speak about the cost uh, and, and Bristol Health plans for making the vaccine available to patients. So um, certainly if any of uh, Dr. Lim or Dr. Zweig or Dr. Akinem, if you have anything to add, you can certainly add them. But I'd just like to add that the state is currently in phase 1A. Uh, that is per the state guidelines in the state's vaccine advisory panel group. Um, and what that really means is it's really uh, made the vaccine is being made available to healthcare workers, uh, critical municipal staff personnel, and staff and residents of long-term care facilities. Uh, Bristol Health will continue to follow the uh, state's guidelines. And we will, uh, once we start opening it up, we are in conversation with the Bristol Burlington Health District on how we can partner to make sure that we make this vaccine available for the greater population when it is time. Um, Bristol Health has, like I said before, uh, been privileged and honored to administer about 1,300 vaccines. Uh, the majority of those um, were Bristol Health staff, but starting Saturday, this past Saturday, we have started to uh, see a, an increase of community or non-affiliated uh, Bristol Health people that are eligible under this uh, 1A phase use our clinic. Um, and to the, you know, we will continue to to do, play our role, do our part to make this vaccine available. As long as the, uh, there is an emergency use authorization for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine at this time, there is no cost to patients to receive the vaccine. Um, though, if you are not affiliated with Bristol Health, there is uh, an administration fee. Um, but I do want to make it clear that the uh, recipient of the vaccine does not have to pay out of pocket. Um, your insurance company should be paying that administration fee. If you do receive a bill uh, for the administration fee from your insurance, um, by all means, please feel free to contact oh Bristol gosh. Health, and we will work with the insurance company oh. to correct that. But you should not have to pay a, a cent out of pocket for, for the administration of this vaccine. Um, but with that said, I think we're starting to get a couple questions in the chat box. So I'll go through these now. Um, our first one, if you got a flu shot this year, would that affect a person getting the vaccine? And I'll open that up to uh, whoever wants to take the question. Yeah, so I would definitely recommend. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, you know, we should all be getting, I've already gotten my flu shot uh, months ago. So um, you should definitely get both. Um, the only caveat is it is recommended to wait 14 days after getting your flu shot. Um, to get the to get uh, vaccinated for COVID-19. Um, I, th I think the theory is not so much that there would be an adverse reaction, um, but that um, if, if there is a reaction, we'd like to be able to um, determine whether it was from the flu vaccine or uh, the COVID vaccine. 
So yes, a flu shot, um, but try to space it two weeks apart. Great, thank you. I see another question in the chat box uh, about scheduling the second vaccine and uh, how to assure that you get the right vaccine. So Bristol Health uh, was originally allocated the Pfizer vaccine. We did exhaust that fat vaccine allocation um, and we are in conversations with the state to continue our weekly allocation. At this time, for first initial doses, we are only administering the Moderna vaccine. Uh, moving into the week of January 4th, we do uh, have plans to split our vaccine clinic in two and have two independently operated clinics where Pfizer will be administered on one side and Moderna will be administered on the other side to, uh, to ensure that we have uh, those safety protocols in place. Um, it's, a, it's very important. Um, when you received your first vaccine, you should have received a card from the CDC that has which vaccine you received. It is extremely important that you bring that card with you for your second dose so our vaccine clinic staff can uh, confirm which vaccine you, you uh, need for your second dose. Um, and there's also some, some, uh, some computerized safety measures built into VAMS so we can also ensure that you get the right second dose um, for your second vaccine. Uh, Albert, I'm not sure there's any questions in the chat box but I think we should touch on children and pregnant women. Usually there's questions about that. So, uh, you know, I just want to point out that the trials were not done in children under the age of 16. So uh, currently right now you have to be over 16 to get uh, Pfizer and over 18 to get the Moderna vaccine. It has not been tested, though it will be down the road, tested in the younger children right now, we don't have any data on that. In terms of pregnant women, uh, they were also excluded from the studies, but uh, we feel that the vaccine is safe in pregnancy, despite what you read on the chatterbox uh, and out there on the web. It is safe in pregnancy. It doesn't cause infertility. All the major organizations, including IDSA and ACOG, recommend that people who are pregnant get the vaccine. Uh, I would recommend, however, that if you're planning on getting pregnant sometime this year, it's probably advisable to get your two doses of the vaccine before you get pregnant. But by and large, it's safe in pregnant women, and it's also safe in breastfeeding women. So I just wanted to point that out. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yeah. Zweig. That's a, you know, I just wanted I just wanted to add is you know, especially for breastfeeding women. I think the the benefit is twofold because we know that um, antibodies can be passively um, given to a, a, a baby that is breastfed. So I think there's a big benefit there. Um, but all, again, I come back to the kind of risk benefit. You know, although the vaccine was not studied in pregnant women, we know that pregnant women who do ha get COVID do have poorer outcomes. Um, and we know in pregnancy. Um, the, the best thing, you know, what's good for the mom is good for the baby. So the healthier that we can keep mom, we know that the healthier and better outcome there will be for the baby. Um, so like Dr. Zweig said, you know, the, the, the big national um, um, OB groups like the American College of Obstetrics have, has recommended vaccination. Um, so, you know, again, it's a personal decision, um, but, you know, I, I, I do recommend it. Thank you. Uh, one of the one of the questions that came in through the chat box uh, privately: Will the vaccine uh, assist with the potential virus that is currently being talked about or witnessed in foreign nations such as England? Uh, as best we can tell, and we don't know a whole lot about this new variant that has a lot of mutations. But we, the the party line is that the vaccine should be effective against this new uh, variant of COVID nineteen. Thank you. Another question, when getting the second dose, should you do the same arm as the first dose or does it matter? Uh, uh, <laughs> we never got that question before, Albert, but I don't really, <laughs> I don't really think it matters. If your arm, if you're not still sore in the arm, you can get the same arm, it doesn't matter, okay? Some people like to use the non-dominant arm to get any kind of vaccine. Thank you. Uh, if a person has an autoimmune problem, is it okay to get the vaccine? 
Yeah, I'd say abs abs absolutely. I think that's even more of a reason to get the vaccine. Um, you know, I get, I get asked this question a lot, specifically, um, you know, I have, you know, diabetes, I have high blood pressure, I have this specific d disease, is it safe to get it? In the, in the clinical trials, um, they're quite open. There, there are very few exclusion factors. So they included patients with, with diabetes, with autoimmune disorders, to see whether it was safe across the board. So ab absolutely, um, there wasn't a single um, uh, medical condition that precluded people from, from getting it. Um, and I would say if you have an autoimmune disorder, it's even that much more important to receive the vaccine. Thank you. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, CDC VAM system does have uh, quite a few questionnaires. And um, to our understanding, the only contraindication by the CDC is in any allergic reaction to any of the ingredients of the vaccine, which can be found on the Food and Drug Administration website, um, on the EUA fact sheets and uh, on the questionnaire that you must fill out when scheduling your appointment. Right, that's correct, Albert. People that are allergic to eggs, peanuts, nuts, et cetera, they can still get the vaccine. Only if you're allergic to certain components in the vaccine, which might be the lipid particles that surround the mRNA, we're not really sure, they're looking into it. But if you have seasonal allergies, food allergies, it's safe to get the vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Lim, can you speak about the observation uh, area that we have set up in our clinic? Uh, is it necessary that you uh, hang out for observation and what's the recommendations for how long to wait? Ab absolutely. So we, ha we have designated a special waiting area um, after you get the vaccine. Um, <laughs> and the concern is that, you know, sometimes some people do feel a little bit dizzy um, afterwards, and that could just be from getting an injection. Um, but we, we recommend being watched for 30, uh, for 15 to 30 minutes. If you can find a safe place, if you can find a, uh, if you have an office in the hospital or a quiet place in the hospital where you can wait during that time rather than drive, that's okay. Um, but as I said, we do have a designated area where you can sit, um, to be monitored as well. We definitely don't want you driving, um, 30 minutes after, you know, within the 30 minutes of, after getting the vaccine. Um, but the benefit of, of sitting in, in, in that area is that you do get to watch a very good uh, video uh, about safety after getting a vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Lim. I, I did hear it's a, it's a, a good looking guy given that PSA video. <laughs> That's what I hear too. Uh, next, next question, is the vaccine needed every year as we get the flu shot? Nobody knows, Albert, nobody knows. Uh, <laughs> there, there are no long-term studies. Studies are gonna be ongoing. We don't have an answer for you, like we don't have an answer for a lot of things. The vaccine has only been in trials for several months. So uh, time will tell. At this point, we have no answer how long immunity lasts, whether it's short term or long term, and whether you need a booster every year like the flu shot. So the final answer is we don't know. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zweig, while I have you, uh, we have a clarifying question about the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine for populations over 65 years of age. Right. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of surprised, Albert, when I actually saw that data. Uh, I don't think it means a whole lot. And again, Moderna thought that it was a statistical anomaly based upon the fact that there were a few cases of COVID in the age group. But I do want to point out that when I saw uh, Anthony Fauci from the NIH get the Moderna vaccine, and he turned 80 the other day, I was pretty convinced that if he feels it's safe for him, it's safe for everybody else. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dr. Zweig. I see a question in the chat box about uh, the vaccine being offered at off-site, off-campus uh, sites. They will bring the Pfizer vaccine and, and yeah, the same here. exact process here. that was followed. Bro, I um, next question. Um, I had an acute sinus congestion and rhinitis and sneezing within one hour of the vaccine. Any thoughts on getting or not getting the second dose? Uh, I would venture to say it's probably uh, unrelated to the vaccine and I would go ahead and get the second dose per protocol, whether it be three weeks or four weeks. Next question, does your blood type make a difference in getting COVID-19? Uh, it, there was some data about that. Uh, 
had to do with people who were type A or AB. You know, this article is written all over the place. How much of this, how much of this is true and how much is false, we really don't know. Uh, I wouldn't put a lot of credibility in your blood type to protect you against getting COVID. But uh, that is in the literature, but I would take it with a grain of salt. Um, and another question, does getting the vaccine cause problem with major organs? Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's nothing to suggest, you know, in the tens of thousands of people that um, underwent the, the vaccine trials, there is nothing to suggest any ma major organ damage. Um, and there's no, you know, based on the physiology of, of how the vaccine works, there really are no concerns about any long lasting damages to organs. But I, I think one would be more concerned about long-lasting organ damage from getting COVID-19, because it affects everything from your, your brain to your lungs to your heart to your kidneys to your liver. So there's no long-term effects from the vaccine, but there are certainly long-term effects from getting uh, active COVID-19 disease. Yeah, and I would, I would add even that there's that high-profile case of that uh, University of Florida uh, basketball athlete who collapsed on the court in cardiac arrest um, who had COVID. And um, at least what I saw there were concerned that this, it could, um, his collapse and uh, heart disease could be a, a result of, of COVID-19. Right. And, and that, that particular individual had COVID back in the summer. So we're looking at, you know, four or five months after having COVID. And the feeling was based upon what was, he was studied in Florida, that he had acute myocarditis causing his problem. So the problems can be long lasting. So we just don't know. Do we have anyone else with any other questions that uh, you would like to answer into the chat box? Do you think there will be studies on the lasting effects of immunity and will Bristol do any antibody testing? Uh, I am sure studies are being done. Uh, Bristol won't be doing any formal studies, but I don't, I don't think we're going to be doing antibody testing either. That really should be done under a trial setting to see how long antibodies last in patients. Like I mentioned, the study that was just printed, just pointed out uh, last week, they followed patients for six months and checked their antibody levels over time. Uh, we don't really have the infrastructure to do that. Uh, we could certainly check antibody levels to see if you're immune, but again, we don't know how long that immunity is gonna last, but the best, best we can tell at this point, it's at least six months, mm -hmm. but we won't be doing any formal studies. I will, um, I will add that, you know, I, I, I think there's definitely a possibility that in the future, um, you know, this may turn into something where we might check titers per se, to check immunity. Um, anecdotally, I did, um, I do have a home antibody test. Um, exactly one week after I received my first injection, I did um, actually have detectable antibodies uh, faintly on a, on a home blood test. Um, so it, 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 at least for me, it, you know, did seem to work um, one week after. And Andrew, Thank you. And, and Andrew Dito, which antibodies you tested for? It was uh, IgG. So the test actually looks at IgG and IgM. So for um, IgG is a long-term, um, uh, the long-term antibody, um, and it was faintly positive. Now, so. do, you know if it was, do you know if it was against the spike protein or against the nucleocapsid protein? I believe it was against it was against the spike protein was the um, was how the home test was de was designed. I'd like to see that, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> interesting. Okay, I, I'd like to add uh, to that question that uh, we do have a medical standards uh, team that does look at research and and clinical outcomes, both of which Dr. Lim and Dr. Zweig are part of, um, and, and I'm sure we will continue to look at research and literature and and make appropriate recommendations to the uh, organization. Um, I, I believe this is our last question. Um, would you advise someone who is generally healthy with no chronic illness uh, to wait to get the vaccine um, or get the vaccine now if, if they are an eligible candidate under phase 1A? 
Um, I would def I would strongly uh, recommend getting the vaccine, um, even if you're healthy without any medical problems. Um, I I consider myself, you know, knock on wood in that in the category. I'm unfortunate to not have any um, medical issues, but I know that by getting the vaccine, you know, I'm, you know, although we don't know for a fact about um, <laughs> being a, a carrier or an asymptomatic carrier, um, I think it's a very reasonable, um, it's reasonable to conclude that the, the chance that you would um, spread it is, is less, you know, I think it's a reasonable assumption that you're going to be less likely to spread it to family, to spread it to patients, um, and this, and this spread it to others. But that being said, I, I personally have also taken care of um, young, healthy patients who need to be admitted to the hospital. Um, and that's one of the terrible things about this disease is that um, we know that statistically, the young, healthy person who gets COVID will statistically do okay. Um, but that really doesn't matter when you're looking at, you know, the person who is that one in a hundred case who is not okay um, and who gets sick. So predicting exactly who's going to get really sick and who's going to be okay, it's it's you know it's it's difficult. So even though you're young and healthy, um, there's there's still a possibility you know you could be a significantly affected by the disease. Thank you. Uh, and, and we just had another question uh, come into the chat about uh, having heart disease and any concerns with receiving the vaccine. No, as a matter of fact, that's a, a reason to get the vaccine with any kind of underlying heart disease, you want to protect yourself because you're in a high risk category. It doesn't cause heart disease. COVID disease causes heart, may cause heart disease in terms of uh, inflammation around the heart. So if you have underlying heart disease, you're in a high risk category, you should definitely get the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Lim, Dr. Zweig and Dr. Ekinem for joining us tonight. Um, I'd just like to go around and give them one more opportunity to uh, add anything that we may have missed um, within our last couple minutes together. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Lim. Yeah, I mean, I do see, um, I do actually see one of our esteemed um, primary care colleagues on the call, uh, Dr. Frazier. I'm just interested, uh, Dr. Frazier, what are your thoughts about, um, you know, the outpatient setting? Have you been handling a lot of questions from your patients about the vaccine? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts uh, about that from your, from your perspective? Well, we're getting calls every day, multiple calls, people calling all the time, asking about the vaccine, where they're going to get it, when it's going to be available, but mostly, how did it go for me, okay? <laughs> just using me as an example. But yeah, there's a lot of people, and I'm assuming that for outpatients, when we get to phase 1C and 2, that these people are going to go to CVS or Walgreens, and they're probably just going to sign up like they currently sign up for a, a flu shot, or they currently sign up for a COVID-19 test. I don't know if you've heard anything further so we can tell the patients what, what we can expect. I know there was some rumor that we might get the vaccines and become vaccinators in our office, but if people are going to have to sit for a half hour, that's going to really jam up the offices. Yeah, Albert, maybe you can um, uh, help answer some of those questions. I, I imagine that um, the hospital will play a part in terms of vaccinating the the community. Um, do you have any idea of the timing of, of that uh, process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we are hearing is the Moderna vaccine is a, is a lot easier to uh, mobilize to remote clinics. Um, we have set up a clinic here uh, at the hospital in our Hughes Auditorium. Um, it just has, has worked out for us with having the pharmacy on campus and, and having, um, as we've heard tonight, uh, so many potential unknowns, um, having our emergency department nearby, um, just as, a, as uh, again, as a, a precaution. We have not had to use it um, to this point with over close to 1,300 vaccines administered. Um, but with that said, we, we are exploring with our medical group um, kind of what that looks like if, if we were to move to the uh, physician offices um, when that time comes. Um, as far as timeline, um, it's very uh, fuzzy. Um, we heard on a, on a call today with the Connecticut Hospital Association and the Department of Public Health that the state's uh, vaccine advisory panel is going to be meeting at some point this week or next week to discuss uh, when it's time to move into phase 1B. Um, again, Bristol Health will, will fully participate in whatever, uh, whatever phase and whatever direction we get from the state. 
Um, I, I have heard rumors. Um, there have been some dates kind of thrown out there, but nothing set in stone um, that it will be uh, made available to the general public or the general population um, probably around April or May. We, we, have, uh, re we have received some, uh, some staff from other organizations who have shared with us that their employer um, has, has uh, you know, notified them that they, they will have to wait until late February, March, um, and those are healthcare workers that that are current in the current phase one a. Um, again, we we uh, we don't have anything set in stone. We are we are anticipating more notification. Uh, here at Bristol Health, our command center watches uh, the governor's press releases every day. Um, we we try to tune into the vaccine advisory panel that are made public, um, and we we are we will share certainly share information on our social media pages on our website and through the local media. Um, as soon as we get them. Okay. Um, another another couple of questions coming in. Um, has there been an increase in minorities getting the vaccine, or is there not a way to tell? Um, so with with our clinic, it is very difficult to tell. Um, it, it's it's information that is entered into the CDC system and it's not made available to us as uh, vaccinators of what um, what kind of answers for ethnicity and race that people have entered. Um, I would say here at Bristol Health, we have seen a very diverse uh, population of recipients coming in for their vaccine. Um, it has been actually very, very diverse, and we are proud to be, uh, to be offering this vaccine to as many people as we can um, in accordance with the state guidelines. I'll, Albert, I'll just chime in. I think... Uh... You know, one of my concerns was um, was uh, the vaccine rates in, in minority communities. Um, and I think I, I have confidence that, you know, a significant amount of, of people will choose vaccination. Um, I think we've seen that firsthand, um, you know, from public, from, from surveys initially when the vaccines came out about who was willing to take the vaccine. I think we were seeing low numbers of like 50 to 60%. Um, but now we know we've seen numbers more in the range of 70 to 80 percent. Um, but what I found concerning were initial surveys in um, minority communities, um, you know, which were in the rate of much less than 50 percent. Um, so that's, that's part of the reason why I thought it was so important to hold a, a, another panel tonight uh, to have an open discussion, um, you know, before the vaccine was available to everyone. Um, but I'm hopeful that, you know, because we know that COVID-19 has uh, disproportionately affected um, the minority communities, um, I think is that much more important that we all do our part to, to get vaccinated. Um, is that much more important? Yeah, uh, Albert, I also want to point out that, you know, both the uh, trials in Moderna and Pfizer had about 10% of the African-American population in their trials. Uh, most of the patients were obviously white, and then there was uh, several, about 20% Hispanic, but about 10% black across both studies. And as I mentioned, the efficacy of the, vi of the vaccine was equivalent among uh, all genders and races. And we'll leave age out for now, but across uh, uh, genders and races and ethnic background, they were equivalent. So we think that's pretty good evidence that it does work in the uh, black population. And as Andrew said, the black population makes up a huge majority of the cases that we see both here in Bristol and throughout the country. So it's important that we get the minority people uh, vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Lim and Dr. Zweig. Couldn't, uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Um, and Dr. Zweig, when, when we say 10%, uh, considering how many people participated in the trial, that is a very significant number of, yeah, of uh, uh, this rate. Yeah, Pfizer had like 40,000 people and Moderna had 30,000 people. So he had several thousand in each group uh, that took the vaccine and it was equally effective. So we know it works and therefore it's rec we re highly recommend people uh, in the minority groups to certainly get the vaccine when their time comes. Thank you. Dr. Zweig, anything you would like to add uh, for the the good of the order and, and for the panel. Gee, well, we've, we've covered a lot about immunity, about the vaccine. Um, uh, you know, I, I think this is the way out. Uh, 
getting this vaccine through the entire population so we can get herd immunity, 70% and upwards is the only way out. So I look forward to a year from now to be able to travel again <laughs> and, and to meet with people and do what we're used to doing. The only way we can do this is get vaccinated, get out of this pandemic and move on with our lives because it's taken a toll on everybody. And I think we're ahead of the game with these two vaccines. And as I mentioned, there are other vaccines coming down the road and hopefully they'll prove as effective and we'll be able to get millions and millions of uh, people across this country vaccinated in a relatively short period of time. Thank you, Dr. Zweig. And do we have Dr. Akinem? I know he has been in and out uh, uh, with higher priorities, but Dr. Akinem, if you're on any last comments you'd like to make for the panel? All right, doesn't look like he uh, he's with us. Um, but again, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Richard Zweig, Dr. Andrew Lim, and Dr. Charles Eckenham for joining our panel tonight and answering uh, many of the questions. Again, thank you uh, to the Bristol Health uh, individuals who have put this together and the local NAACP under Lexi Mangum's uh, leadership for hosting tonight's panel with the Bristol Hospital Diversity Committee. Hey, Albert, um, if, if, I, if, if you wouldn't mind, I just want to say one more thing. I think there is a, yep. you know, a, a good comment about um, by Deborah Dorsey, you know, about understanding the Tuskegee experiment that happened years ago um, and understanding, you know, the one reason why the African-American community would be hesitant to take the vaccine. And I completely acknowledge that, you know, that's a very palpable um, and significant reason to, sh to have concern um, ab about it. Um, you know, obviously that brings a, a much, a much bigger problem, uh, and a much bigger issue, um, about trust, uh, and, and trust of the, um, of the American healthcare system with African Americans. But what I would say is, um, that's why everyone on this call has to do their part. Um, and I'm not talking about pressuring people and, and just forcing people to take the vaccine. I'm talking about having conversations. Um, and it's what I've done with my team in the ER and, and throughout the hospital is have a conversation. If someone wants to talk to you about the vaccine, if someone has a concern, make sure that it's a credible resource, you know, make and encourage people to seek answers. If someone doesn't want to talk, if someone doesn't want to take the vaccine, find out why, you know, there may be a good reason why there may, they, they probably have a, a valid concern, um, but get them pointed in the right direction, point them towards the, CD, the CDC website, Point them towards our our website. Point them towards our primary care doctor. You know, um, you know, don't point them towards Facebook. You know, I know there's a lot of misinformation on Facebook, um, but it's our job as everyone on this call, in our community, to do our part to make sure that we all are armed with the correct information so we can make an informed choice. So that's kind of my plea to to everyone on this call. I know there's about 40, 50 people on this call, but we all our circles are much bigger than that. So we all have the power to really make a change in our community because that's what this is about, right? I mean, this is about making a change in our Bristol community to make sure we can get out of this as quickly as possible. And we all have a piece of that and we all we all should feel empowered to do so as well too. So that's that's kind of my um, that's kind of my last piece that I'll say. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, perfectly said, Dr. Lynn, thank you. Um, again, thank you to, uh, to the, our panel uh, to the Bristol Hospital Diversity Committee, uh, the local chapter on WCP. Um, we, we are here for you. Bristol Health, again, is excited to be partnering and joining this venture to make the vaccine accessible for as many people as we can. Um, I, I'd invite you, if you have any questions, please feel free to email command center, uh, that's C-O-M-M-A-N-D-C-E-N-T-E-R, at bristolhospital.org with your questions. Uh, we do have an active medical standards team that will be uh, glad to take your questions and answer them in a public forum confidentially. We also, uh, for our Bristol Health employees and uh, allow guests into the hospital, we have a drop box right outside of our command center so you can drop your anonymous COVID vaccine questions that will be answered by our medical standards team. Um, with that said, thank you everyone. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you and eventually seeing you in our clinic to get your shot. Excuse me, Albert, this is John Lodovico. I just got to mention that uh, 
uh, being a board member all these years in the community and in, in the community, I've lived in this community all my life. And I've been asked an awful lot of questions. Dr. Liam, you hit the nail right on the head. A forum like this, so much information has come out. Things that I, I, I thought I knew, I was correct on most of them. Dr. Zwag and, and clarification on uh, how long will this uh, vaccine last? Do we need to get it? That's been, that question has been asked to me at least a dozen times. Is this shot, is this vaccination, do we have to get this every year? And my response to them was just what you said, and I'm not a doctor. I don't know, I will try to find out. So if anything came out of this tonight, that's one positive question on, on my end. This is this was such a great, great gathering of everybody getting the right message out there. Bottom line is the only way we're gonna eliminate this terrible, terrible thing we're under right now is folks need to get vaccinated. And there are a lot of questions out there. There's an awful lot of questions out there and there's some folks that aren't, aren't all that hot about getting vaccinated. So I think that Albert and, and uh, WNCP, this has been a great, great forum and with a lot of positive, positive information. And I wanna thank you very, very much for everybody, all the docs that are on uh, taking their time tonight. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, John. We will make this, uh, this recording available um, and posting it widely um, for our community. And, and if needed, um, I'll commit Dr. Lim and Dr. Zweig and uh, Dr. Ekinem if he's on, uh, if we need to do another panel, uh, I just signed you guys up. <laughs> Sign us up. Thank Albert. you. Sign Sounds good. Up. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night, guys. Thank Have you. Have a happy new year. Thank you. Everyone be safe.